written in the law? How, how do you read it? So this lawyer responds, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Jesus replied, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But this lawyer wants to justify himself. So he asked the question, Who is my neighbor? So you have to understand kind of the cultural implications that's going on behind the text. Because there's so much going on behind the text, if you understand what's going on behind the text, then the text kind of reveals itself a little bit more. So you understand it's a teacher of the law, it's a lawyer essentially that stands up. Now they're going to have this debate between Jesus and this lawyer. And again, the idea of the, the Jewish culture, the Jewish community was, if, 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 if I worked hard enough, right? If I did enough good things, then they would believe at the end of their life, it was almost like God would stand there with the scales of justice, and he would put on one side all the good things you did, and he would put on the other side all the bad things you did, then you would stand back and wait with bated breath to see which way the scales would tip, and you'd always pray they would tip in your favor. And so this idea of loving God, the way that you love God was, well, you offered sacrifices, right? That you would come and you would remember the Torah, right? That you would have a good uh, mentor and you would be a good disciple. You would, be, you would hit your wagon to a really good rabboni, a good teacher. And so when he calls him teacher, he realizes he's giving credence to who Jesus is. Teacher, rabbi, I understand that you're a rabbi. I think Jesus is now using this as a teachable moment because he says, when you read the law, how do you read the law? How do you inherit eternal life? He starts to quote Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's called the Shema. The way they would say this in the morning, they would say it at, at night, they would say it to begin the day, they would say it to end the day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Worship the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Right? So there's another instance where a teacher of the law gets up and they question Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus points back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema. The lawyer gets it right. It's about loving God with everything. And he wants to take it to a whole nother level by saying it isn't just about loving God, but it's also about loving my neighbor. If you go and read the, the Ten Commandments, six of them have to do with our relationship with our neighbor. Four of them have to do with our relationship <coughs> with God. And so when Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with everything, love your neighbor as yourself, the law and all the prophets, all the commandments are wrapped up on those two things. And it says, so he asks this question, which is a great question, right? I know that I'm supposed to love God with everything, right? So I have nothing left. And love the neighbor as much as I love myself. And Jesus says, you're right in answering this. And to be able to justify himself, right? What it means is to expose to the light. So here is this man who wants to show everybody that I really am righteous. Like if you look inside of me that I'm a really good person. Ask the question, what's the question? Who exactly is my neighbor? Right, so sit at the person next to you, right? I'm going to ask the question, who is my neighbor? Look at the person next to you and say, you is my neighbor. You is my neighbor. Let's try this again. So I'm going to ask the question, who is my neighbor? Look at the person next to you and say, you is my neighbor. You is my neighbor. All right, so maybe that's not like uh, grammatically correct. So I'll ask the question, who are my neighbor? And you can say, you are my neighbor. You are my neighbor. Right, don't look at me. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person behind you. Who is your neighbor? You is my neighbor. You is my neighbor. Who are my neighbor? You are my neighbor. So really the question is, who is my neighbor? And, and I would answer the question like this. Who is your neighbor? Jesus tells the story. And, and, and really the answer is, any person that you see in need. There's a friend of mine who is, who is kind of a, a mentor of mine, or a prayer partner of mine. And, and I remember I was talking to he and his wife and, and this idea, well, who is my neighbor? Right? And he said, it's, the answer is, she actually said the answer is, Sandman. I was like, the Sandman? But hey, that's the best little guy that comes in with a little thing while I fall asleep at night. He said, no, it's an acronym. It's S-A-N-M-A-N. -A -N. So who is your neighbor?
favor is any person that you see a need and that you have the ability to meet a need. S-A-N-M-A-N, write it down. See a need, meet a need. Because in Luke chapter 10, he continues on after this question. He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to expose to everybody else his righteousness. Well, who's my neighbor? Jesus tells this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So, verse 32, so now a Levite, when he came to the place where he was, and he saw the man, he saw the man, he took pity on him. No, I missed it. When he came to the place, saw him, passed by him on the other side. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, saw him, took pity on him. He went to the man, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine. Then he went to the man, put him on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he went and took two denarii and gave it to an innkeeper. Look after him, he said, when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra, any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think is the neighbor? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go do likewise. I look at this, and this is probably a story that all of us have heard if you've been in church most of your life, like I have, several times. Even if you haven't been in church all your life, like I have, if you attend church semi-regularly, or at any time, you probably get a message on this. We all kind of know the, the big players, and we know this is a story to illustrate the point, and really the point is, who is my neighbor? When I go through this, what I've always done is I've seen come in what I would call the big three, right? It's the Samaritan, it's the priest, and it's the Levite. And the whole message is kind of centered around the Samaritan, the priest, and the Levite. But in preparation for this message, when I was reading through this, it's like I felt like God pricked my heart. I read somebody else, and they said, there's actually a lot more going on. There's a lot more characters in this story than you first look. The first person that we see in the story is who we would call the miserable man. Why? Because he's going from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jericho to Jerusalem by himself. Right? In Genesis it said, it is not good for man to be alone. But I think the translation that they left out is because he was just messed up up. Right? On the 17th, and all the ladies that are going away, you'll say, hey man, brother man, like, I understand it is not good for my husband and my children to be alone by themselves. They're just going to mess everything up. Go ahead and prepare for it. You should know what's going to happen, right? That's the reason why God provided a suitable helper for him. Right? So when we read this, this is the first person that we find. Is here's this man who's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about a 15-mile walk, right? And so it's something that could very easily be completed in a day. But it was a treacherous area. It had mountains, right? And what would happen is the robbers would hide in these caves and caverns and little nooks and crannies as you're traveling down this road, and they would wait to look and see, well, is there somebody that we can subdue, or are they traveling in a caravan? Because if it's just one person and there's several of us, we're going to descend down from the mountain, we're going to beat him, we're going to... And this is something that happened on a regular basis. So for us, it's that Jesus is telling the story, and we have to kind of unpack everything, but if you were a Jew listening to the story, immediately you'd be like, oh yeah, I know exactly the road that you're talking about. It'd be like me saying, you know, if you wanted to get from, from here to, to Fort Wayne, you know, get in the direction how to get to I-69, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Remember, there's the one place there you don't stop there, you don't really want to stop there, right? So they understand, like, okay, and this guy's going by himself. Then what happens? The robbers descend on him, and they beat him, and they strip him, and they wound him, and they leave him for dead, right? A lot of times... We read over the very beginning part of this parable to, to get to the people, right? But there's no need for the people if we don't miss out, if we don't focus on this miserable man who's by himself. Here's the second thing that I realized. There's another character that we read over. The thieves. The, the rest of the story doesn't matter if we don't focus on the man and the thieves. So the first question is, in my mind, well, who is the man? And I think what Jesus was saying is, it's us. Do 
few. If you have any hours. What do you mean? How many people do you know that have been stripped of their dignity? Maybe because of the bad decisions they've made. How many people do you know who are wounded spiritually? How many people do you know who are wounded physically? Emotionally? Relationally? But if we read the story of the Good Samaritan and we want to flip over and say, we want to get to the good part. So then the next question is, okay, so we have this idea of if we're a miserable man. We're the thieves. The Bible teaches us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. So if we receive good things, where's that from? There's also the spiritual world that we don't see. It's kind of invisible. So when bad things happen to us, Many times is it from? Well, if it's not from the good, it's probably from the bad. And the Bible teaches us that there is a lion known as Satan who's roaming, looking for someone to devour. So I think Jesus is showing us in this story that there's so much more going on right in front of our eyes, but we just read over. We just miss it. Here's another thing I want you to write down. So we got Sandman, CNA, Unity. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. It's real simple. Hurt people, write again. Hurt people. Yes? People who are walking around physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially wounded, hurt people are the very first, very first people to strike out and hurt you. Why? Because I'm going to hurt you before you hurt me. I'm already wounded. And if you come again, if you ever got close to a wounded animal, what's it going to do? It's going to try to kill you. Why? Because I'm trying to protect myself. So, we're setting the pattern, you understand, right? We're, we're getting into the second act, but don't miss this. There's the miserable man, then there's the thieves. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and we saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So we see the, the, the passing priest, right? He's walking by, and, and what is, I think if we would talk to the priest or if we were to interview him, he'd probably have this list of excuses, right? Whew, I've been at the church all day, offering sacrifices. I mean, I'm just, I'm busy, I'm, I'm beat. My dogs are barking, I mean, I'm walking, and if I stop, like, I just, I, or the other way, right? I, I gotta get home, like, my wife, she gets mad at me, right, if I'm late, and I'm late all the time. So we make a list of excuses. Not only that, right, but as a pastor, I empathize with the priest. And I'm like, you don't understand, you know, if I was a priest, it would make me unclean. Because this man is stripped and beaten and left for dead. And if I touch him and he happens to die, well, then now I'm unclean, right? Then I can't go and do what God has called me to do. Serve his people. You see it? I, I was talking to somebody else, and this is what they told me. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to steal it. And he said, our church is full of willing people. And I was like, really? Like, how did you, how did you kind of create that culture? He's like, yeah, the only problem is they're willing to let somebody else do it. <laughs> Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help. I just don't want to leave the thing. Right? You know why people say that? Because then when it becomes time to get called upon, well, I got something else going on, right? 